Welcome back. Welcome back. Hello. How are we? Good to see you all. Um, I'm just finishing setting up here so I can uh, get a grip on what's going on here. Ah, there we go. Now I can now I can see everything. Hope you can hear me all right. Um, let me know if you can't hear me. I'm trying a different microphone. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm the National Ambassador for the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. Um, tonight is Sunday night. It's the Sunday night live stream. Uh, Peter Perfection joined. Ah, Tim, I'm actually talking about some of the things you've just written about um, in your latest article. Because it sort of inspired me because I wrote something similar uh, for a sponsored piece for LinkedIn um, about a year ago about sort of where is the industry headed. Uh, and that was fantastic. And I, I sort of, I just read some of your article just now and um, I was really quite um, inspired to maybe talk a bit more about it. And so I'll take your questions. I'll see who's joining. I've got another screen here. This, Complicated, I know. Um, so I'm just going to quick, quick shout out to Robert Akers, Muzman, of course, um, Jay Hodes, Mc, uh, McConaughey, I can't say that, Ski Boy 86, Chapo 68, 86, 68, there you go, Peter Perfection, uh, Jay Hodes, Chapo, of course, thank you, yes, wow, he's cute, wow, Casa Davinos, Jose, how are you going, uh, True North, Alex, Sally, hello everyone, thank you all for joining in. It's the Sunday night live stream. I'll, I'll be here to take your questions, have a chat to you about some whiskey, talk a little bit about a few things that have been on my mind today, uh, especially this is the day after an event. It's always that if I've had a big event on a Sunday, uh, Saturday night, which I have yesterday with the Brook Laddie night, uh, those who haven't seen the photos coming out of the Brook Laddie night, uh, it's so so much fun. Whiskey Sec, Jamie Poos, thanks everyone for joining in. Um, those who haven't seen the photos, they're up on our Instagram, they're on our Facebook, they're in our group. Just a quick little plug, if you're not in the Facebook group yet uh, for the SMWS, it's a great discussion there all the time. It doesn't deviate too far from the society as, as a whole, but you can talk about whiskey in there and it's always a lot of fun, which is, uh, uh, some, some groups deviate these days and are, are a bit hard work, I'll be honest. Um, but tonight is a bit of a chance for us to catch up. It's almost like a weekend, the last sort of, the last live stream of the week before tomorrow, of course. And then we talk about some other topics coming through. Peter Perfection, Tim, if you're still in here, if you're still live, I'd love to show me a wave and tell me that you're here because I've got a few things that we we uh, could definitely go over here. Yo, mate, yo, whiskey sec, good to see you, good to see you. Uh, Vinci, thank you so much for joining. So, yeah, a few things going on at the moment. Um, first of all, there's a comment that uh, a friend of mine, Tim, uh, made in um, in his article recently. I was reading about how some distilleries, especially Australian distilleries at the moment, are uh, what he believes are, um, are cashing in, if you like, uh, sort of jumping in on on a on a on a band on a bandwagon, jumping in on a, a an idea, or a difference of idea, or something like that, um, and they're jumping in the, to cash in on an on an idea that they thought might be a really wise way to make some quick money, uh, and then they quickly discovered that it's. Um, it's not really um, it's not really the way to do it. Peter Perfection, hello, good, thank you for joining. Uh, so, and Dave Miller, Doghead Books, thank you, uh, both of you for joining as well. So, there's a couple of points in in Tim's article he wrote, uh, which I think he put out today, which was about um, on Peter Perfection's article. Well, well worth reading. Uh, like I said, it was something I wrote about a year ago, and I, I'm, I'm still quite passionate about. One of them was cashing in. Now, some of these distilleries are jumping in quite early, quite late, I should say, and wanting to make a quick buck. They wanted to put two-year-old whiskey out. I'm talking Australian whiskey here, and this sounds like a rant. It don't mean for this to be a rant. Uh, I know that some of you have commented that some of, my, some of your favorite live streams of mine each night have been the ones where I've gotten on my soapbox a bit. I don't intend to get that way tonight. Um, however, if you know, if the questions come, come out a certain way, then uh, we'll see how we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of one of those things where it's like, uh, you know what, there's there's no quick routes in whiskey. There's no quick route to success. Uh, no, it, it all comes about through time and effort. And there's often you see what I like to call cowboys. Uh, those, and I don't mean, you don't, you know, I'm not saying what, like you have to have training to be a distiller. Uh, it, certainly, it certainly helps. Um, it's a science distilling. And get it, having the right training to distill spirit uh, goes a long way. And I think that's really quite uh, pertinent there. That's the first point. Um, yeah, Rob Akers, I'll post the link after. Um, I'll post a link to Tim's article afterwards. Caltay99, thank you for joining. 
So like I said, tonight we're just talking about a few different topics on my top of my head, but really just a chance for us to catch up weekend, a bit of a wrap from Brook Lady last night. But I was just talking about uh, just this, this cashing in scheme that's happening. What happened in Australian whiskey? For those who don't know, um, Australia, Australia's been making whiskey as we know it uh, since, uh, I'm gonna get the date wrong, uh, 1820, 1825, somewhere around there, and whiskey's been produced in Australia in one way or another since then. Um, no, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself there. No, no, it was 1825 or 1828, somewhere around there, was when the first recorded instances of um, distilled spirit going into oak casks. We don't know whether that was rum or whiskey, but distilled spirit was happening in Australia. And they know of rum being distilled in the 1850s, then, and then they know of whiskey distilleries in the 1880s, etc., etc. Um, and then there was a bit of a lull, and then Cradle Mountain, then Lark, then... Uh, uh, Bob and uh, Bill and Lynn and the whole and Patrick and a whole different group of people in Tasmania reinvigorated the Tasmanian distilling scene. Um, there was whiskey being made in Australia all the way through then. I mean, it's just, but times changed and there's reasons for that, which I'll come back to later. Fast forward to 2014 and Sullivan's Cove uh, won the World Whiskey Awards Best Whiskey in the Best Single Malt Whiskey uh, in in the world for the year. That's a really big boon for an Australian whiskey uh, when you think about it. That's obviously changes the industry quite a bit. Um, 1820 to 1830 time frame. Yeah, that's right, Caltech. That's what I meant. Sorry. Yeah, whiskey legend joined. Good to see you, Jono. Uh, Caitlin's awesome photos joined. Caitlin's awesome photos joined. Good to see you, Caitlin's awesome photos. Um, Raymond, thank you for joining. So my first point here is that we, we sort of had a sort of a bumpy start, a slight lull, a reinvigoration about 22 years, and then and then you have 2014, they win, they win that award. I'm gonna give full credit to the team at Sullivan's Co for riding that wave, for riding that wave of um, uh, winning that award because that didn't just propel Sullivan's Cove onto the world stage. And then we're talking five years ago now. I mean, it didn't just propel them onto the world stage, it propelled Australian whiskey, Tasmanian whiskey and Australian whiskey onto the world stage. Um, so what that does is that people start looking for all sorts of Australian whiskey and there's suddenly money in Australian whiskey. What does that do? It means it brings out a few of the, uh, though it brings out a few sort of people with some maybe perhaps some deep pockets or the desire to get some deep pockets and they see it as a, as a way to, you know, double, triple, quadruple their investment in a short amount of time. If you could set up a distillery and then suddenly three years later you're producing great whiskey and then five years later you win an award, that's a, what, an eight year investment of something you're making ridiculous money out of a, a distillery. So Sullivan's Cove saw that uh, and that came along, that was a huge boon for Sullivan's that changed the industry forever. And, and that's something that you really have got to, like you say, that's, well, it's changed it, especially in modern era, it's tra- changed a lot. Um, Sullivan's Cove, just like many distilleries in Tasmania, uh, at that time, uh, early on, in the early years, I mean, 1999 to sort of, I can safely say 2009, um, there, there was good whiskey being made back then as well. Uh, there was also a lot of bad whiskey being made. And it wasn't, it's not just, it's not just symptomatic to any one distillery. It was just sort of, we were, it was still in that modern learning curve. But I think I think quality has increased a lot, um, but we're still there's still problems plaguing it. But not Sullivan's still problems plaguing um, Australian whiskey, and I mean in general. We'll come back to that in another session. But really, what I wanted to start on there was just saying that you see these often newcomers in the last five years. Uh, I'm not saying we're you know cause I'm all for innovation and new distilleries, but there is about a cowboyism that you see sometimes. And if you see something, let's put it this way: if you see another distillery advertise a guaranteed 9.9 percent per per annum return on a cask, run for the hills. Uh, that's the best way to start start us off here. Uh, a quick quick shout out to those who have been joining. Ali's Whiskey, Ali, good to see you. Uh, JMO23, Traveling Whiskey Reviews, Robbie, always a pleasure. Caltay asks, uh, look at Lark, best known Australian whiskey, and Tim Boone, second best in Australia. Caltay, Tim Boone? That's a, that's, a, that's a big call. I mean, they're fairly newcomers to the scene in some ways, um, but I'd say their presence is one of the best known uh i wouldn't even i wouldn't put them in the top 10 but uh, i could be wrong uh any tazzy whiskey in line to be an smws bottle you think jhode 77 uh yes yes uh we we are working quite closely with some australian distillers at the moment to source 
uh, casks for the society. Um, there's been a few uh, uh, false starts in that realm in the last uh, couple of years. Uh, well, actually, I could say, actually, there's an email chain dating back to 2006 to do with this. So, um, but there's, there's been a few false starts over the last uh, decade and a half. But it comes down to a, a, a bit of uh, economics and also a bit of quality. Uh, imagine if for a second we released an Australian whiskey and it was sort of like it's, we print the age statement on the bottle and say it's a five year old whiskey, which would be old for some distilleries and young for others. That's kind of five years old would be called a young whiskey in the Sullivan's Cove language or an old whiskey if you're talking about Starwood or something. Um, and that's fine. We have lots of lovely young whiskies, but you just go, what was the, um, you know, uh, if, if then we bottle that and it's not great, we wouldn't bottle it. It still has the past panel. There's still quality uh, ups and downs that need to be addressed over time. And I think over time that'll, that'll start evening out a bit better than it has so far. I'll talk more about that in a bit. Um, a few questions coming in here. Uh, best social media game in? Uh, you mean you mean Tim Boone there, Cal? I'll, I'll have to take your word for it. I don't know about that one. Um, pick something out of uh, Duckett's Warehouse that I have seen you in. <laughs> yeah, look, if I could be pinching casks off Duckett, I think that'd be fun. But, you know, he he doesn't bottle... Uh, or not, in fact, I can't remember the last time Tim bottled a um, single cask whiskey. Um, he very, very, very rarely does it anymore. Uh, I'll be honest, I don't keep track of every single Heartwood or TIB release. But, um, you know, you taste. I've tasted most of them. and But I just go like... So he's um, he's definitely done all sorts of things like transferring of spirit to one, one cask or another and re-racking others and doing finishes and doing and vatting casks together. I'm not allowed to use the word vatting anymore, don't forget. No, you can still use vatting and it's okay in Australia to use the word vatting. But it's... um. Vatting of casks and making a single malt whiskey. He's making some great single malt whiskey, but they're not necessarily single cask. And as you know, the society only does single malt only, but predominantly does single cask, single malt whiskies um, with a few rums, bourbons, cognacs, and exotic cargoes along the way. A few experiments. Um, he used to, j Hodes. He's done a few single casks in the past. But no, he hasn't done any in, in, in a while. Uh, yeah, Cal asks, is Tim Boone having the best social? Is that what you mean? Yeah, I think that's what you mean. Uh, I don't think that's really like... Does that does that equate to being best known? I think that's a bit of a that's a bit of a long shot if, if you ever ask me. It's like, are they the best known? Why are they the best known? Is it is it purely because they're spending more on social media? Maybe it is. Maybe they're just doing heaps and heaps of really good content. I, I don't know. I actually I don't see much of it if I'm being honest. But maybe I'm in the wrong circle for that kind of stuff. I, I'm not I'm not probably the typical audience for um for their whiskey. But that's okay. Everyone finds their niche. So that was my first point tonight. I was talking about that cashing in point that uh, that Tim made about how. It, we're talking that we're in sort of now the postmodern era, if you like, so of of local spirit, because we're in five years since that award, and that award did change the industry uh, uh, in many many ways. Whiskey and wisdom, Andrew, thank you for joining in. Uh, Barry Malia, always a pleasure. Good to see you. Um, he still does on occasion. Um, the last I think was market correction a few months ago. Was market correction a single cask, Alex? I'm not even sure it was. That's why I would, I would have mentioned it. I did come to mind, but I was thinking, I thought that was actually a, I'm pretty sure, well, finished as a single cask, sure, but I think it went from one to one to one sort of thing. I think it had a couple of re-racks going on in there. I think it moved around, but I could be wrong. I could be wrong. Um, single cask, Sullivan's cask, yes. Ah, oh, well, okay, yeah, sure. I mean, maybe it was, maybe it was single cask. Um, there is a bottle in here somewhere. I don't know where it is. It's in a box that way somewhere. Um, Petrino, Andrew, good to see you. Um, so that was my first point. The second one was, uh, whew, I mean, one, one, one comment that I often see in discussions around, um, uh, around the, the whiskey scene in general, around whiskey as a category, uh, is that, oh, well, there's a crash coming. There's got to be a crash coming eventually, right? It's like, where's the crash, you know? Uh, and that's not one that I, um, you know, it's like, it's always like, um, oh, whiskey's doing so well. And if you look at, if you pay careful attention to what some of the big distilleries um, and distillery owners and distillery groups are spending money on, you'd almost think that there's never one coming. Um, and I just, I'll just like to remark as well, the last time there was a proper whiskey crash, uh, you could probably safely attribute that to around 1982, 83 era of Scotch whiskey. Um, or even just just earlier than that, and and you know, just always have had, had their ups and downs since then. Of course, it hasn't just been thirty seven years of continual growth. 
Uh, well, it has, but I mean, it's like overall continual, but you know, every distillery has their ups and downs. But what I would say is that one of the major changes we're seeing, we won't see, I don't think we're gonna see another crash. Here's my prediction. I don't think we're gonna see another worldwide whiskey crash anytime soon. Uh, people have been predicting the gin crash for 10 years, saying, oh, you know, 10 years ago, literally, I remember people saying, oh, yes, it's a gin overload. We're so much gin on the market now. Surely there's gonna be a crash soon. There's always waiting for that sort of, that drop in the graph. I don't think we're gonna see that with whiskey, only because two reasons. One, if you pay attention to these big, the big distillery companies, Diageo, Pernod Ricard, especially Edrington as well, uh, you see how much money they're spending on distillery. McAllen with their $500 million uh, fund and things like that, you go, they, they've got people who predict these things and they obviously have a much stronger connection with the market than I do. And they, and obviously, and they just go like, it's, it's uh, you know, where that's going, they pro can, they're looking far into the future. You wouldn't build, you wouldn't spend 175 million pounds on a new distillery only to go, well, it's probably gonna crash and market's gonna crash. It's gonna, bottom's gonna fall out in five years time or t even 10 years time. It's like, you wouldn't, that would not be a sound investment by any means. They're playing the long game. Yes, I reckon we'll see, you know, slight dips here and there, but I think the line's gonna keep going for at least the foreseeable future. Let me get a few comments and questions in here. Uh, Jay Hood's uh, shortcuts in whiskey don't, usually lead to good drams. Quality takes time and effort. Musman, couldn't agree more. You can't cheat age. And the number of age, uh, semi-aged spirits and sonically aged experiments. There's one out of, uh, out of America called Abomination. I thought it lived up to its name. It was an abomination. I didn't like it one bit. I don't think you can cheat age. Even I was tasting that one blind as well. I don't think you can cheat age. No matter how many distillers have tried, maybe someone will get it right one day, but quality takes time and cowboyism never works. It was four different casks that spend its time in J Herds. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, there were many markets, uh, there were many markets aimed at Australia, tourists that were based around the 12 apostles and do limited runs, but it's okay. But it well known in Melbourne, well in my circle of younger friends. I'm learning something every day, Cal Taylor. That's why I love this game. Uh, sorry, I think so, but I call that single cask the same way as society does. If the same spirit is transferred across casks, the language is still single cask. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes and no, Alex. Yeah, I mean, you're right. But we don't, we never do, like, the society never does, like, 10 casks, then, you know, all finished in one. We've done one to one. Maybe that's what, look, I don't know, sorry, I don't know what the Hartwood one is. I've got to look at that, look that up. Tasmanian Whiskey joined. That, that's a pretty official sounding uh, Instagram account. Uh, Yawn Boon. <laughs> Yikes. I didn't say that. Uh, Prohibition was the last big crash. Yeah, it was, it was. And I, again, I don't think we're going to see another Prohibition. That's, that's what it really is. Um, a retail crash, well, no, yeah, well, Prohibition was a much bigger crash in the United States, of course, which controlled the market then and pretty much now as well. But that's changing, of course, as we see the rise of China and everything like that. A retail crash is more likely, true. 128 kilobytes of, is all the ram you could ever need. Uh, whiskey sec, uh, Cooper, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you a funny little story. I did work experience when I was in year 10 in high school uh, with Compaq slash Hewlett Packard computers. I was interested in a career in IT at the time. It wasn't, I really didn't know what I was doing. I was year 10, you know, you're 16 or something. You're like, yeah, I want to work in computers or something. That sounds like the future. And I, I, and I did a, I did a, um, and there's a, there was a new computer being launched at the time. Uh, yeah, there was a new computer being launched at the time and it had, and they, they were like, they had this one room for the computer in the office and they, it had 512 megabytes of RAM. And I remember the actual IT guy saying, that's massive. You'd like, you would literally never need more than that. You'll never need more RAM than that. And they were, they were, they were being serious. I know they're probably taking the piss of that old, that old quote, but you know. Um, finishes, yeah, Barley Brains. Seamus, thank you for joining. Could not, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, subscription clubs have taken a large market share, not knowing names. Robbie, I know what you're saying, and I don't think that's a bad thing. I mean, really, uh, a lot of people find their way through to something like the Scotchmore Whiskey Society through these subscription clubs that offer a core range bottlings and they want to explore, explore a bit more and they want to see what a, what a single cask whiskey could taste like. And that uh, I've got no problem with that, honestly. It's yes, the market changes, subscription models changes. Uh, there's one that does like a whiskey pack in the mail and there's like every month or something. And there's all these, all those kind of ones. They, they exist in the UK, US. I think they're doing fine. I, I'm, I'm more for them. Jeremy, always a pleasure. Monarch Perth, good to see you again. We've got, to, we've got to touch base again, Mike Worth. Um, 
Is Chapo a Russian bot? Yeah, close enough. Any Australian whiskey is recommended for an amateur single malt whiskey club? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. I'll leave that to the comments to suggest that. There's lots of good Australian whiskey out there. It depends on what you want to spend your money on. And um, yeah, I mean, it, yeah. Uh, Fodies, Fodies of Stuff joined. Oh, Fodies of Stuff. Thanks for joining. Uh, so Matt, completely off topic questions, but thoughts on Westwood whiskey based on Oregon? Yeah, no, no, no. I've, I've tasted, Cal, Cal I've tasted uh, Westwood and Westland, but the Westwood is the Oregon one. I've got a couple of bottles of theirs. There's a stout one and a normal one or something. I think it's great whiskey. I think they're on the right path. I think doing the whole sort of grain to glass thing is, is very trendy, very transparent. Uh, but if I'm being completely critical, it's just too young. It's very young, grassy spirit. And when you get that sort of spirit, that sort of almost like um, fainty, fainty note on the nose, and you, you get like a, like a, you, you smell it, you go, wow, it's closer to new make than it is barrel. Mm, okay, you know, I like a young whiskey, but that's pushing it. And then you sort of say, oh, okay, well, that's not really my thing. I like it. I just think it, it needs more time and a lower price point for what it's actually trying to be. Um, yeah, here we go. Um, Jay Hodes uh, says she has a, Jay Hodes has a, a great idea for a whiskey club bar. Uh, I don't know if you get it to work, mate. Not that I get it off the ground. Maybe we can get it off the ground. We'll see how it works. Shoot me a DM and with your idea and see how we go. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that was sort of my first few points tonight. I'm talking a bit about the cashing in aspect, which I think is one that is should be pay, you should pay careful attention to. Um, and I don't, that's not just to say just trust uh, established brands. I think that's a bit of a cop out. I think a new brand, a new distillery, can come. I mean, I've seen, I've tasted new distilleries that are coming out of the UK, and some of them are incredible. Tasted, new, and some of them aren't that good. And it's like, it works both ways. It doesn't matter what country you're in. It's, it comes down to a lot of factors, and a lot of it comes down to training, uh, knowledge, previous knowledge, spirit education, wood policy, management, staff, cask sourcing. So much, so 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 many factors, and there's not one sort of, there's no sort of like master distiller or anyone like that who can fix these things it's more about uh it's about coming in and you know uh you know fixing things not fixing it there's no master distiller who can make or break it it's it's the team it's the people i've said before and it sounds corny i know but i've said this before uh whiskey often you hear that line whiskey is you know barley water yeast but it misses the three other most crucial ingredients which is people time and the barrel and the cask sorry but it's that so you say that whiskey has to spend time in a cask, it, it has to mature. You can't cheat maturation. The people, the people that make it, the team that make it, the people that, it's, yeah. someone made a comment to me last night about how um, at the Brook Laddie night, the gathering, Brook Laddie gathering here last night, um, someone made a comment about how, oh, you don't, you don't realize how, uh, how much making whiskey in Scotland is like a, it's a farm. It's, it's, it's farmers, sorry. It's farmers making spirit. It's people, you know, who, who, just the people out there that are rolling the barrels, making the barrels, cutting the barley, uh, malting the barley. It's a, it's farmers making great spirit. So sometimes you're a bit like, oh, it feels very far removed from the whole sort of, um, sometimes feel a bit far removed from the marketing of the spirit or from the, anyway, a few other factors, but it's, it's the people that make it. So yeah, time, people, and um, cask. You can't cheat in any of those, any of those things. Let's see what comments are coming in. Um, uh, what have we got here? Adelaide Whiskey Lover joined. Thanks for joining in. Uh, <laughs> if you have questions about worth, message Andrew Durbage. If, if anyone wants to get in touch with our seller master, Whiskey and Wisdom, um, he, he's, uh, that's, his, that's his, uh, his blog, his way of writing about whiskey. It's fantastic. Some great articles on there. Um, and talent and knowledge, very important, very true. And the Whiskey Tailor joined. Thanks for joining. The third point, before I get into the third point I want to make tonight, um, was really just about... Um, Maybe I'll have a nose of this. I'm not going to tell you what this one is, actually. It, it is one of the Brook Laddies we, we tasted last night. It was one of the standouts from the night. I'm just having a, a wee dram of that. Then I think I might have one small dram of the um, the 113.15, an apricot jamboree. Uh, someone said to me last night, they're going to work out how to fix my reverse camera problem here. Uh, that's a 113.15, an apricot jamboree. 15 casks from this distillery in 36 years. Very few. That's in the um, the light and delicate flavor profile. We don't see that light blue strip very often, um, but when we do, there I think they're worth paying attention to. There's some lovely casks coming out of there. Uh, but in the meantime, I'm just going to enjoy a little bit of this. Mmm. Mmm. 
Lovely. Look at the. I don't know if you can see that on camera, but the legs on that. Unctuous. Unctuous is the word for tonight. That's the word of the night. There we go. Um, let's have a look. Um, <laughs> Tim, yes, correct. Uh, the colour sort of gave that away, didn't it? The Jura Whiskey Distillery has a magical vibe to it in Scotland, so the people are making it at everything. I'll completely agree. Uh, I'll, there's one comment I'll make at Jura, however, is that is, is, one, is one that I'll agree with someone else that said this, in that it's a distillery where everything is just... It's fantastic spirit, but there's something there's something going. It's like Jura. As soon as it gets to bottling hall, something goes wrong. I think sometimes I haven't enjoyed a, a core range Jura in a long time, and I tried the whole new range just like two weeks ago. The new Seven Wood. Whose idea was it to do a Seven Wood? Seriously, did they just try and find every type of cask they could? It's like ah, oh, it's a mishmash. It's seven different dinners all combined into one. I think it's a bit. I mean, it's fine. It, it was an approachable whiskey, but it sort of lacked any real character. And I think that's something quite important in a whiskey, personally. Um, <laughs> Tim, yeah. Sorry, yeah, the, even, 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 with my, uh, even with my lamp on, it, it sort of the color sort of gave that one away, didn't it? Uh, so yeah, I mean, we're, that was sort of the, the first two points I want to make tonight. And uh, the last point I want to make, actually, uh, which was... Uh, I was going to talk a little bit about regulation, but I think that's a bit dry. I think I'll leave that, for, maybe not dry, but just I think I'm sort of flogging a dead horse a bit there. So what I'm going to talk about just now is just, there's a comment, there's a comment at the Brook Lady Night last night about when a whiskey tastes like that distillery uh, and how often some whiskeys, uh, like I've, I've often said, I've used, often used ex-bourbon barrels uh, or ex-bourbon hogsheads as an example of whiskey that is honest. It doesn't try and hide behind any, um, you know, uh, thick wine finishes. I love a wine finish sometimes in a whiskey, and I, I love a, a big sherried whiskey and things like that, just like you. Um, but there's a comment that Andrew made last night. Our cellar master made about how it's how honest whiskey can be, um, sort of like sort of a. There was a 23 year old uh, ex bourbon barrel whiskey, and you think after 23 years in oak, it's sort of just like. Um, it, it was, it wasn't, it, after 23 years, and I could still like taste like that distillery profile. I can taste that and say, oh, that's distillery X. Uh, whereas with other whiskeys, often out of those X wine barrels and those X sherry hogsheads and things, um, it could often be so saturated by the cask profile that you think, oh, is that still, is that still what the whiskey is? Is that still, is that from that distillery? I've tasted some sherry whiskeys in the last couple of years, especially. Uh, that you may as well just serve me a car strength sherry, uh, and I think that's super disappointing. Um, I'm I, I'm of this. I, I like my whiskey on the younger side. I honestly do. I've always, I've, I've not always, but I've taken a, I've always taken a, a often an appreciation for it because you get a, a, that balance of the of the spirit character coming through, but not being new makey, but being balanced with against the cask. And I think that's really important. And one that I've banged on about before on here about how. The cask profile can often overwhelm a spirit. And there was one whiskey last night where it was lovely. It was a super clean 20 year old sherried uh, Brooklady. And you say, oh, that's that's a lovely whiskey. It was like, it was rich, it wasn't sulfured, it had age, it had beauty, it was, it was just delicious. But is it still that distillery? Of course it is still that distillery, but it's sort of like, it's so soaked by, the, by X wine, so soaked by X sherry. It's sort of, it's like, well, uh, you know, that's that's great. And that's a different experience. But I sometimes find that they sometimes get a bit lost. Whiskey gets a bit lost in, uh, and especially as I, as I made mention last night, that I love my peated whiskey and I love my sherried whiskey, but rarely do I love them together. And this is technically an unpeated whiskey, but it was still from Isla. And it had that sort of, that coastal note to it still, which was lovely. But it was sort of, uh, rarely do I find they meet in the middle and... That's why, I'll be honest, I rarely buy any whiskey, especially ones, I'll rarely buy any whiskey that is um, on the spec sheet is sherried and peated together. And there's been a, quite a few lately. Uh, let's, let's grab a few, let's grab a few comments here. Um, our hands, thanks for joining. Uh, that's a geeky topic. <laughs> Regulation is a geeky topic indeed, Muzz. I think that's what you meant. Mike Perth, ignore the new range. I haven't bothered trying it. Go back to the originals. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take that one. 
Is there export duty on alcohol export? Um, yes, there is. Refill for life. Bam! Yes. <laughs> Whiskey sec. I couldn't agree more. Refill for life. You know what? One of my favorite whiskeys I tried in the last year was actually, it was a Society 39. Uh, and it was a 10-year-old uh, Linkwood from the, from the SMWS. And it was 10 years, second fill or third fill, ex-bourbon barrel. Delicious. It's like refill is just, the, is just so good. It doesn't have, it beats that, it, it's where the age meets that, meets right in the middle and you get a nice, lovely uh, spirit character meeting with the cask and the cask is not overwhelming it. Especially if it's a distillery with a lovely spirit character. And especially if it's a distillery uh, with a nice big spirit character that, um, that Andrew has written about before as well, like uh, with a distillery with worm tubs perhaps. And he was asked to name them and he, I think he got 20 out of 21 or something. I wouldn't have got that that many. I would have got maybe 10 or 15 max. But um, you just sort of, it's like, if, you, if I see something like a, you know, a 15 year old Balmanac or a 15 year old Ben Romac or something where you go, yeah, I, I love their spirit character. It's not gonna be overwhelmed by cask. That's extremely exciting. Uh, hell yeah, that sounds amazing. Hell yeah, it does. And it was, and it, and it is. So long gone now though. That, I, I bought that bottle a year ago and it's uh, well and truly enjoyed and gone by now, gone to the Whiskey Memories Archive of Good Whiskey. Uh, I'm going to have a dram of this in a moment. Uh, I'm going to see if there's any more questions coming through. Um, I don't want to ramble on too much tonight. Like I said, it's been a 30 minute session already. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming, and I'm 32 minutes late asking this, but you can all hear me all right. I'm trying a different microphone tonight, so see if that works all right. Um, yeah, so that was um, that was where I was coming from tonight. I was talking a little bit about cashing in, talking a little bit about possible crash I don't believe in, and when a whiskey tastes like a, the actual whiskey. And that's exciting. These are three very varied uh, subjects tonight, um, and three to really just to jump on and have a, and have a, um, and have a, taste of different things and see what it's all about. I don't have the leaflet in front of me because I'm not that organized. Oh wait, wait, I think there's one, there's one behind me but I've got the mic attached. Hold on one sec. There it is. Uh, the gathering events, if I turn this around, it doesn't make any sense because it's all gonna be backwards for you but um, we've had the Vaults dinner, we've had the Bricks Distillery night, we've had the Rare Brick Lady evening. Four more gathering events to go this month. I'd love to see you at them. Uh, the Gathering Canberra, uh, the Gathering Melbourne, the Gathering Adelaide and Gathering Sydney. Um, you'll see me at the Melbourne and Sydney ones, and you'll see Jenny and Alan at the Adelaide one, and and Alan hosting the Canberra one. I I've got to get that right. Sorry, that's just changed at 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 um, Hippo Co. Fantastic partner by there in Canberra, and if, like I say, the Gathering Sydney. I'll see you there uh, this Friday night. Following on from that, of course. The night after, Saturday night. Now this is really crucial. Saturday night is the gathering box, which is that one there. I'm gonna be in this office with Andrew Durbage, our cellar master talking about whiskey, having a yarn. We'll broadcast that one if I get this right. <laughs> if I can set up the tech for this one, we'll be broadcasting that live to Instagram, to Facebook and to YouTube simultaneously. So whatever your preferred platform, I know some people don't use Facebook, some people don't use Instagram, whatever. We'll have it on YouTube as well. Um, if you don't have time on a Saturday night to watch that, you can watch it later in your own leisure, which would be fantastic. So um, if you wanna get one of those boxes, if you're in Perth, I'd recommend selecting Express Post by tomorrow. Um, but anyone else, or maybe even Hobart, I'd say Express, but anyone else who hasn't got one yet, there's still about 80 left or something on the site. Grab, grab one of those boxes. It, it's a tasting box with five whiskeys and all the tasting notes. It's gonna be a great way to um, taste through a few things. Sound is good, Matt. Even getting the reverb when you nose the glass. Ooh, glass reverb. <laughs> We're going 3D whiskey this time. No Tassie. Yeah, next year. Sorry, J-Hodes. No Tassie gathering this time, uh, but we'll be back down in Tassie. There'll be a Tassie me members night, I think, coming up. Let me check. Yes, there'll be a Christmas party for Tassie as well, which will be a Christmas members night. That's to, soon to be announced. I've already announced on my Twitter, actually, the Melbourne and Sydney Christmas party dates, but I'll talk more about them tomorrow night. Have a great Sunday, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for being a part of the of the, uh, of the live stream every night. This is always fun. And um, I'm gonna enjoy the rest of this whiskey and just push this out a bit and have a marvelous end of your weekend. Uh, have a dram, see you soon, and uh, happy dramming. Now, I'm sure it'll be said.
Thanks, everyone. Oh, and by the way, check out Andrew's IGTV on our stream as well. Lots of things going on always. Lots of great content. Lots of things to learn. I hope we'll learn a few things tonight. That's what it's about. Just having a chat, learning a few things. And I'll speak to you guys tomorrow night, same time, same place, 8 o'clock. Cheers. Bye for now.